Why did late medieval European knights stop using shields? Hi folks, Matt Easton here of Scholar Gladiatoria. Now, um, I've seen a couple of discussions in the last week talking about this very topic, uh, one person I know, and another discussion actually under one of my videos. And the basic question is, why did late medieval, so let's talk about 15th century primarily, why did 15th century European knights stop using shields? Well, we need to unpack that question. Um, the first thing that comes up is people always answer immediately, Oh, well, you know, it's because of gunpowder. Shields weren't very useful anymore, um, so people went to using two-handed weapons. Or they talk about the um, armour developments. Now, I think it's a much more complex question than that. But nevertheless, I think that I can give a relatively concise um, answer to at least my theories for why that should be the case. And also, importantly, was that actually the case? I think there's a lot of assumptions made about uh, late medieval knights based on looking at certain sources, and there's a source bias based on what we look at. Did they actually stop using shields? So this is actually a two-part video in a sense. Did they stop using shields? And secondly, if they did, or at least if they, they started using less, why was that the case? Now this is mostly considering combat on foot, but it does to some degree apply to knights on horseback as well. Anyone who's looked at medieval sources will notice that 15th century knights are often shown with varieties, varieties of two-handed weapons, two-handed versions of this essentially, war hammers, pole axes, glaives, things like that, rather than um, this type of weapon in a shield. But that being said, if we look at reenactment, living history, if we look at uh, something like Battle of the Nations, the HMB, full contact um, steel armoured fighting league, then indeed in those we see that one-handed weapons and shields are very popular but of course we have to remember that isn't a real medieval battle scenario and they are their own type of tournament. Now before I get further into the video I want to have a little word about our sponsors for this video who are the awesome Raid Shadow Legends. As you almost certainly know Raid's the hugely popular turn-based fantasy combat game. So stop and take a breath. Have you ever ascended the Doom Tower or crushed the Ice Golem? Raid has over 500 champions, hundreds of artifacts and countless ways you can combine skills and teams to play Raid your own way. You can download Raid right now onto your phone or PC using my link below in the description or the QR code on the screen right now. Now you hear me talk a lot about all those awesome champions, but who are my favourite five champions that I actually use playing Raid? So my first favourite that I have to mention and I use pretty much all the time is Kytis. And Kytis, as we've seen before, has got some awesome armour. Uh, a black and yellow theme, which is great, of course, in my club colours, and you can see that I have um, levelled up all of his equipment. Next up is Aethar of the Sacred Order, and he's got some awesome armour. I love his great helm with the horns on it, um, and he's a bit of a dual wielder there. He's got an axe and a sword. Next up is an absolute mainstay. Lots of people use this guy. It's Kale. Um, you probably get him near the beginning, but you can level up, level up, level up. He's got um, a boundless potential. In at number four is Shaman, and she is an orc. But what she's really best for is reviving or rather um, reincarnating people, bringing them back to life. And in at number five is actually a fairly new um, person, new character to my team, and that is Yaga the Insatiable. And he is a kind of undead Minotaur type thing. But he has got really powerful strikes and I've leveled up all of his offensive uh, capabilities. What I personally love the most about Raid is playing against other players in the arena, but I also love playing in the dungeons, trying to improve my times, and I enjoy making a new team, like upgrading my team and giving them new skills and new weapons and upgrading their weapons. So what's new in Raid? We're just this month Raid has released a ton of amazing new clan features and improvements. There are brand new quests for you and your clan members to work on together, new benefits for every clan member just for being in the clan, and even a brand new clan shop that gives you access to some incredibly powerful items. I love playing with other people, so I love all the new content for me to explore and compete with my clan. This month's also got new champions to collect from fragments in the Doom Tower, and a load of events and competitions to take part in. If you want to get a huge head start in Raid, all you have to do is click the link in my description below or scan my QR code, and you'll get an epic hero called Chonaro, who's amazing in the Doom Tower. 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 ancient shard, so you can get summoning an awesome champion as soon as you get into the game. All of these rewards are going to be waiting for you up here in the inbox, and remember this is only available for new players and only for the next 30 days. You can find me in game as Captain Context, of course, and if you're quick enough, you can even join my clan, and I will see you in game really soon. Cheers, folks. So thanks for sticking with me. Now let's get back to the main topic of this video, which is why did one-handed weapons and shields, at least for the fully armoured, 
high status, uh, top level, 15th century, so we're talking about late medieval, early renaissance, knights fall out of favour. And did they fall out of favour? With the simple answer to the second part of that question, did they fall out of favour, we have to answer kind of yes. But we need to unpack that comment slightly because they didn't completely go out of use. And I see people, as is often the case on the internet, people make black and white, hard and fast statements that knights stopped using shields because of armor or because of firearms. Neither of these things are true, okay? Uh, firstly, knight didn't completely stop using shields at all, and we'll go into some detail on that in a second. They didn't completely stop using one-handed weapons um, either. Um, additionally, it, neither of those things were, I think, anything to do with firearms, or at least not directly to do with firearms. And equally, I don't think it was completely to do with armour either. So the first thing to address is that absolutely, the shield and the one-handed weapon were the typical sidearms of the medieval knight, right the way through the medieval period since knights existed, all the way up until about the middle of the 14th century. Now, there were a number of large changes that happened in the middle of the 14th century. In terms of society, the Black Death, in terms of uh, the way that knights functioned on the battlefield, the way they fought, certainly in uh, England, for example. Um, additionally, their armour. The armour development was going under huge leaps. Uh, there were a lot of external influences as well. There were a lot of things going on on the fringes of Europe and within Europe. Uh, changes in warfare, cultural interactions, and so on and so forth. So the middle of the 14th century is a hugely interesting uh, period of time, which obviously I can't go into much detail on in this video at least. Um, but the fact that you need to recognise is that there were changes going on in the 14th century in terms of the arms and equipment and fighting um, characteristics of the knight and the way that they functioned both in knightly society, there was the, the kind of rise of the kind of dual, knightly dueling culture and the, the sort of romanticism of chivalry that happened in this period. But equally, there were changes on the battlefield as well. So obviously on horseback, the lance was the main weapon. On uh, foot or after the lance had been broken or lost or expended in some other way, then a one-handed weapon of some sort, often a sword was worn at the side, regardless of whether a person had something like a war hammer or an axe, or even a flail in some cases, um, uh, or a mace or something like this. But they essentially did have one-handed weapons coupled with shields, because of course the shield was used, um, shields of various types, usually um, so-called heater-shaped shields rather than this round shield, but round shields were used as well. It also, sometimes what are called hand pavises, so smaller versions of big pavises. So yes, absolutely, um, that was typical up until the middle of the 14th century. But those things didn't go away. And it's very important to mention that knights did continue using these things after that point, even if they proportionately, at least for the knightly classes, seem to have become less popular, and new two-handed weapons seem to have come in and got more popular, most particularly the poleaxe. So if we look at the late 14th century and into the 15th century, really the um, the weapons that we most often see knights using on foot and fighting with are the poleaxe in its myriad of forms, sometimes with a hammer, sometimes with an axe, various forms of spike or hammer on the back. Also, they use things like glaives and various other types of polearm, but essentially polearm. And additionally, we also notice in this exact same period, in the second half of the 14th century, the two-handed sword, or rather the long sword or bastard sword, so swords that are able to be gripped two-handed of various lengths. Um, obviously, these are big Zweihanders, that's kind of a later development. But swords essentially like this start to become more popular as well in the second part of the 14th century and even more popular in the 15th century. So what we see is a movement, certainly for fighting on foot, but to some degree on horseback as well, a movement of knights using two-handed weapons in preference to using a one-handed weapon and a shield. So we're going to unpack why. But it's very important to keep reiterating that the shield didn't go away. The shield was still used in mass by um, less armoured, and lower social status soldiers on the battlefield. And we can see it in numerous manuscripts. Shields of various types, big pavises, medium-sized shields, heater shields, and round shields like this, uh, early forms of rotella, um, and indeed, obviously, bucklers of various types as well. So all sorts of shields, from massive to tiny, were used by lots of different, uh, um, lots of different soldiers on the battlefield, including people like archers, 
billmen and spearmen, uh, pikemen had it as a backup, um, uh, gunners, all of the other types of troops. Now you have to remember that certainly within war, the knightly classes are a tiny percentage of the army. There may be, you know, five or ten percent maximum. The rest of the soldiers are made up of common people who in many times would be carrying a form of shield, be it a small buckler or a larger type of shield. So shield didn't go out of use. So when people talk about things like gunpowder, it's pretty much irrelevant as an answer to why did shields um, become less popular for the knightly classes because most of the other soldiers still use shields, okay? Uh, and in fact, gunners are one of the people who still carried shields. So the very people using the firearms were often the people who had large shields in the form of pavises. So hopefully it's clear now that shields did become less popular for the knightly classes, but they were still massively widely used by people who weren't knights or weren't high status men at arms. Okay, but in addition to that, shields did continue to be used by men at arms and by knights. Now, what scenarios did they continue using them in? Well, as I've said, they did occasionally keep using them in war. And it does seem, looking at the manuscripts, that there does seem to have been a preference for shields in a siege context. And you can understand why. If you're besieging a fortification, you're more vulnerable to missile fire because they're just up there reloading and shooting at you continually. So even if you're a knight in full armour, you might want to carry a pavis around for your general protection. Okay? But there are other scenarios as well where shields are shown in knightly use, most uh, obviously in certain duelling and tournament and joust contexts. So when we look in those, when it's a one-on-one -on -one fight, if it's in a tournament or a knightly duel to the death, and remember they're two separate things, you can have tournaments that are peaceful tournaments just intended to show who's tough enough, um, and then you have knightly duels that are decided they're essentially a duel to the death. In addition, if we look at jousts, obviously when you're holding the couch lance, very often a shield was either held or worn actually attached to the uh, armour itself, and so shields were used in that context as well. So knights did continue using shields, just not as much as they had done before, but within certain contexts, they were still using them just as much as they had before. So in answering this question of why did shields become less popular for knights, I have thought up three points which are definite reasons why for them not, uh, the, the not reasons in other words. These are definitely not reasons. One of them is because of missile fire. So I've talked about firearms, but ad additionally longbows and crossbows. I think we can categorically say that uh, improvements in missile weapons, be it crossbows, longbows, firearms or anything else, were not a reason why they started carrying shields less. Another reason why, which was not a reason for them to carry shields less, was not because armour was invulnerable. Just because armour had improved, and we'll talk a, a bit more about that uh, in a second, just because armour had improved, both in terms of design and technology, the, the metal that it was made from and the way it was heat treated and how prevalent it was and things like this, just because armour had improved, people in armour were not invulnerable. They could still be wounded with arrows and crossbow bolts and obviously firearms, as is mentioned in various sources. They may have been slightly more protected, uh, but that doesn't seem to have been purely a reason for them to abandon shields. Indeed, we see plenty of examples in art of people wearing complete plate armour and still carrying shields, uh, especially something like a pavis. A pavis will protect you better against a crossbow bolt than armour ever will, because there's no gaps in a pavis, and a pavis, a pavis is a very thick piece of wood and leather. Um, so quite simply, shields can protect you from things that armour can't. And finally, and connected to that point, we can also say not a reason for shields becoming less popular with knights was because shields didn't have a place on the battlefield anymore, because somehow uh, warfare had changed so much that shields weren't useful. Well, we've already seen, and I can demonstrate with countless examples from art, that huge numbers of soldiers who weren't knights on the battlefield still carried shields right the way through the uh, 15th century and into the 16th century. And the Spanish uh, sword and shield guys were still being talked about uh, by people like Machiavelli. And they were famous, okay? Shields were still carried in the exploration of the New World when fighting the Aztecs. So shields were still an important thing. And in fact, we see uh, steel shields, uh, like this rotella, still being used um, in the 16th century, and there were even bulletproof types of shields. We found some on the Mary Rose, 
uh, even with guns fitted in the centre, in the case of the Mary Rose ones, gun shields, we still see shields being a thing in the middle of the 16th century. So absolutely, shields did still have a place on the medieval battlefield. So finally, some answers for you. So I know that this is probably what you started watching this video for, some actual answers to the question. So I'm gonna give them, but I think that everything I've said up until this point, definite reasons not why, why shields became less popular for knights, and also showing that yes, indeed, shields did become somewhat less popular for knights, in a battlefield context, or at least in certain battlefield contexts, uh, but they were still being used, and they were still being used by lots of other soldiers. Very important to reiterate those points. So the first, and I think a very important, and it can't be overlooked and understated point, for why shields did become less important for uh, the, certainly the top echelons of nobility, be they knighted or not, but the high, the high level men at arms, is simply, yes, armour did play a part. And the simple fact is that armour changed in various ways, numerous ways actually, which meant that shields were less needed. Okay, now that's not to say that a late 14th century knight was not well armoured. In fact, late 14th century armour was very, very complete, okay, certainly in the best case scenarios. In some areas they wore slightly less armour than others, but if you look at um, an English knight of the year 1400 or 1390 or a French knight or uh, an Italian knight of the same date, you'll find that they're pretty much covered from head to foot in plate um, with mail either in the gaps or a full mail shirt underneath. Um, so the simple fact is they did have complete armour, but there were further improvements that happened in armour during the 15th century or rather, and this is probably more correctly stated, there were changes that came in which became more prevalent and more widespread, okay? So a couple of those changes, for example, are the material that the armor was made from. So yes, indeed, some armor in the 14th century was made of carbon steel hardened, okay? But in the 15th century, it seems to be that a lot more armor was made of carbon steel and hardened. So much so that even brigandines, many brigandines, were proofed, tested that is, against crossbows. Okay, so there were many hardened carbon steel brigandines being made in certain parts of uh, Europe that were tested against crossbows and you paid extra to have one of those uh, crossbow proof, I was going to say bulletproof for a second there, but probably would be against a pistol, um, but crossbow proof uh, brigandines. And that goes for all other armour as well. So this helmet that I'm holding here is made of hardened modern carbon steel, but you could get uh, many, many helmets that were made of hardened steel in the 15th century. So absolutely armour technology went on, but also armour design. The simple fact is that if we go into the 15th century, certainly by the middle of the 15th century, we find that armour is so complete, uh, certainly on the knightly classes, that it really closes and covers all of the possible gaps and is hugely protective. And moreover, if we look at certain styles of armour, particularly Italian styles, but also this runs over into certain uh, English and French armour as well and Spanish armour, we see that they are more heavily protected on the left hand side where a shield was. So clearly what they're doing, they're still acknowledging that the left hand side is still very vulnerable, more vulnerable than the right hand side. The right hand side might be wielding a weapon, one handed sword for example, um, or couching a lance and so needs to be a little bit lighter and more maneuverable. And the left hand side, when you're using all sorts of weapons, even two handed weapons, the left hand side is often presented to the opponent a lot of the time until the moment at which you're striking and then you'll come back to guard and you'll be left hand side presented again. And obviously on horseback, back, uh, couching a lance, the left hand side is going to take the brunt of the trauma. And most people are right handed and strike strong, most strongly from their right hand side, so that's the side that's going to get hit the most. So quite simply, armour, technology, design, preference for a lot of protection on the left hand side, meant that shields weren't so necessary as they had been before. Now the next probable reason, which is connected to the previous one, why uh, shields probably became less prevalent for the knightly classes was quite simply that two-handed weapons are more potent, they're more powerful. Not only in the case of hitting, although obviously yes they can hit more powerfully, you can wield bigger and heavier weapons if you're wielding with two hands. You can wield your big bill with heavy langets on it or an owl space or a pole axe, of course, pole hammer, lucerne hammer, things like this. Even bills and halberds, although they tend to be more for lower class soldiers. But essentially pole arms and bigger swords 
are gonna hit harder, okay? That's pretty obvious. Not only do they hit harder because you're applying more leverage, but also you can use a bigger, longer weapon with more leverage uh, and it can be heavier and things like this. But in addition to that, think about against other armored opponents. Uh, so a lot of you will know that often we'll be using um, the weapon like this, uh, if it's a sword for example, to get the point into gaps. And a large weapon like this has the capacity to still be used fantastically in half sorting. And because it's longer, it provides more protection against people with spears and things like this. It's also easier to protect against people swinging halberds at you when it's a larger weapon. So quite simply, you know, smaller swords and one-hand swords have their own virtues, which maybe I'll discuss in a future video. But two-handed weapons, if you can free up your left hand and not be trying to fuss around with a shield or a buckler, because you're protected by armor, then clearly a two-handed weapon offers some advantages. And importantly, remember most of the time, statistically, so if, let's say, in a, in a well-equipped army, 10% of the army is made up of knights, if we call them that, men-at-arms, then 90% is not. That means your odds of fighting another knight are actually not that high. Sometimes they might have singled each other out, they may have had a grudge and people may have let them go at it. That did happen and it's mentioned in the sources. But statistically in a normal skirmish or battle, if you're a knight, you're fully armoured, you've got your two-handed weapon, the people you're fighting against are usually going to be common soldiers with pole arms, aren't they? Because pole arms are the most prevalent weapons on the battlefield. So in many situations, if you're fighting against people who have got bills or halberds or spears or pikes, you want a weapon that is able to um, either um, you know, defend against their weapons or indeed reach them. If you're fighting against infantrymen with pole arms, then clearly something like that, like a warhammer, might be great if you're up close and smashing someone's armor if they're another armored knight. But if you're trying to get at that lightly armored billman or spearman who will want to keep distance, they don't want the armored knight coming in close with his rondel dagger and his armor and all of this stuff. They want to keep them at range where they can get the massive percuss percussive effect um, of their pole weapon. And in that situation, a weapon that can actually reach uh, the opponent and more easily defend against that massive pole arm, so you can try and get in close, is going to be advantageous. So, big two-handed weapons have lots of advantages if you don't have to worry so much about the shield because you're more protected against missile weapons, you're more protected against random hits you didn't see coming. You've got your visor down, you're, you've got all-encompassing protection, you don't need to worry about your shield, so you trust in your armor so that you can dish out bigger blows, have a longer reach, more control of your weapon, and more stamina as well uh, to keep giving those blows and be more offensive. Okay, and we're into the final two reasons why I would um, give why shields became less uh, popular for knights, and that is quite simply that as warfare changed, the majority of the men who were being led on the battlefield in the late 14th century and certainly through the 15th century were wielding either missile weapons or pole weapons. And quite simply, you are, as a knight, a, an officer, essentially, a commander of men, might be a small group, might be a large group, some type of retinue. Um, and you're in charge of people who've got a certain type of weapon category. Now, once we get into the 15th century, the majority of troops on the battlefield who you're likely to be leading are either archers or crossbowmen or gunners, or they are billmen, halberdiers, pikemen, this type of thing. Now, in that context, a shield and a one-handed weapon doesn't fit in very well. It's archaic. It's, you know, something of the past. And back in the days of shield walls, um, or if we go back to the, you know, the kind of 12th or even 13th century, a lot of soldiers would have had a shield and a spear. The common soldiers would have had a shield and a spear. So if you having a shield and a sword or a shield and an axe or a shield and a spear indeed, you fit in well to that unit. You can fight with that unit. You can lead that unit. You are harmonious with them. But within the context of a 15th century battle, if most of your men have bills or halberds, you want a weapon that kind of is similar to their weapons. It kind of doesn't make sense for you to have a little short uh, stubby axe, one-handed axe or a short arming sword and a, and a shield because they're going to be hitting the enemies and you won't be able to reach the enemies. <laughs> Equally, the enemies are likely to have the same weapons and for the aforementioned reasons, you want to have kind of something big that can oppose and reach those enemies. So quite simply, within the context of the time, as a leader of men, as a, an example, fighting from the front and commanding and still trying to fight and be effective as well, 
you're going to want to have weapons, in other words, pole arms for the most part, that are more similar to your men. Even if you want a sword, then you still want a sword that is of a reasonable size a lot of the time. And, you know, some long swords as well, especially with one-handed thrusts, you can get pretty damn good reach on them. Uh, but you're going to want to have weapons that can somehow fit in with the unit that you're leading. So the last point which I want to state here is a possible answer. This is purely a theory kind of off the cuff. This is something I thought about earlier when I was making my sort of notes for doing this video. And that's to do with the ethos of the knightly classes at this time. So we know that the knightly classes had become, they'd had a crisis of security in the 14th century. And it's one of the reasons why they were so heavy on reinforcing the idea of chivalry and uh, kind of like, oh, we, you know, we need to be as great as the knights of old, and we get all these manuscripts looking at, uh, you know, tales of King Arthur and the Song of Roland and the Romance of Alexander and all of these things in the 14th century. So the knightly classes were trying to reinforce their place in the world, in their mind, uh, in the 14th century, and certainly this goes through into the 15th century as well. And so they were almost kind of uh, cosplaying or reenacting what they perceived to be knighthood from an earlier age. And this was, of course, because of numerous social changes, the beginning of the Renaissance, the Black Death, uh, the rise in the cost of labour, uh, uh, all sorts of different complex uh, social changes that were happening at this time, which, and their place on the battlefield as well, the fact that you had the rise of semi-professional indentured soldiers who were better equipped, better armoured than they'd ever been before, better trained. The birth of uh, learning and treatises and universities, uh, fencing schools and this kind of stuff. So... The fact is that the knights started to question who they were and what they meant and what their place in the world was. And um, I think that we start to see in the 14th century, this attitude is carried out in a trying to, um, trying to win honour and trying to win glory and fame. And if we look at someone like Marshal Boussico of France, he went and competed in every tournament he could. He tried to uh, fight in every war that he possibly could. Um, there's the deeds of Jacques de Leylang as well, Burgundian knight, who tried to fight everyone in the world with a pole axe. And we've got this kind of period when these knights are trying to prove their value and their worth in God's eyes and also society's eyes and the other knights and the church and the king and everyone else. So they're trying to prove their value and their purpose. And I think to a certain degree, this is their improvement of armour freed them up to go on the full offensive, perhaps. Um, and we, there are a couple of sources which actually lament the fact that, oh, knights of these days um, just charge into, into battle. Um, you know, they, they, they're not cautious. They're not clever anymore. They just want to win glory. Um, we certainly see this at something like the Battle of Cressy. You know, one of the possible reasons why the English so annihilated the opposing army at the Battle of Cressy in 1346 is because they picked a defensive position and fought essentially in the Scottish manner, plus lots of longbows. Um, so they, they fought a defensive battle. And the waves of French and Burgundian and other uh, Hungarian and other knights that turned up to fight sort of just stormed up the hill and kind of assaulted them in, in a really uncoordinated fashion, trying to win glory, shouting, Mon Juan, trying to take them down. And I wonder, and again, this is complete conjecture, supposition, I wonder if this played a part in the preference and the move towards two-handed weapons, because if you've got a big two-handed sword or a pole axe or some type of, you know, uh, some type of large two-handed heavy weapon, Trusting in your armour, you can go charging into the enemy ranks and trying whacking around and taking out as many people as possible. And you can't really do that so much with a one-handed weapon and a shield. One-handed weapon and a shield is certainly one-on-one. -on -one. You could say a more sensible weapon um, a set um, combination. But it, it's more of a defensive thing. And I wonder if the defensiveness of the shield had become, not abhorrent, but, but almost less knightly and less manly. Now that might sound a funny thing for me to say, but if you look at period sources, we do see these sorts of things expressed. We do see certain physical things that knights of that time, if we look at, you know, people like Busico and Pietro Monte, said that, oh, a knight shouldn't do this thing because it's a sign of weakness or it's a sign of, you know, whatever, womanly behavior or weird things like this. So they were very obsessed with trying to appear almost like superheroes of their time. And I wonder if that somehow affected the move towards big two-handed pole axes and two-handed swords and stuff like this. Possibly, 
Possibly not. As always, I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on this. So, do you think I've covered all the main reasons for why the shield became less popular for the knightly classes? Do you think there are other reasons that I've missed? Do you think I've overstated or understated some reasons? I'd be interested to hear your comments. But just to reiterate once again, because it's really, really important to point this out, shields did not go out of use. They did not go out of use because of firearms. Shields stayed in use, and shields were still in use in the 16th century, and they're still quite prevalent and important. But yes, it is true to say that shields became less popular not completely out of use at all, but they did become less popular within some contexts for the late medieval knight. I hope this has been useful and interesting to watch. I hope I'll see you again back on the channel for another video. Cheers for watching. I have been Matt Easton, and I'm pretty sure I'll continue to be. Cheers, folks.